recording? Great. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, move over now to a fascinating project. And this is a joint presentation by Jim Barry and René Gapper. And uh, Jim is joining us by Skype as we talk, and is listening to us from uh, his uh, American residence. And Jim is the administrator of the Barry DNA Project and a member of the Earls of Barry Moore Project, the first effort to do DNA testing of the remains of a member of the Irish aristocracy. Jim's been an amateur genealogist for more than 30 years and a genetic genealogist for more than five. Uh, educated as a social scientist, he was a professor of politics at George Mason University and a researcher in conflict resolution at the University of Maryland. And Jim has published in the fields of international politics, negotiation, and artificial intelligence. And of course, his family is from Barry Row, County Cork. Um, Jim got into genetic genealogy as one of the beta testers for Ancestry.com and shortly thereafter began Y-DNA testing with Family Tree DNA and founded the Barry DNA Project in 2013. Now, Rene, on the other hand, and Rene will be starting the uh, presentation, and Rene is uh, a freelance consultant forensic anthropologist he trained as a medical dissector, prosector in Berlin, uh, Heidelberg, and Dusseldorf, and uh, pursued doctoral research studies in forensic anthropology and human anatomy at University College Dublin in Ireland. He got involved with genetic genealogy by accident, uh, because he was contacted by Roger de Barry and James Barry of the Barrymore DNA Project. Uh, they were looking for some advice on the possible sampling and testing of human remains located in a crypt in Castle Lyons, County Cork, and he was able to help them with the licensing issues and suggested analysing the remains from a forensic anthropological perspective prior to any destructive sampling. So it gives me great pleasure to present Jim and Rene to talk to us about uh, the Barrymore Project and the forensic anthropology a bit to start off with René first. Ladies and gentlemen, René Gapert. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, before I start, um, I'll, uh, I should warn you um, that there will be images of human remains uh, in this presentation. Um, so uh, if uh, it is of a sensitive nature, so I'd like you to respect that, please. And um, if you feel a little bit uncomfortable with it, you know, there's no problem if you want to stop outside or something like that. Okay, so as uh, um, Morris said, and first of all, thanks very much, Morris, for the invitation to present here at this uh, 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 fantastic conference. It's my first time, um, my first time delving into genealogy. And um, so I tell you a little bit about what, uh, as a forensic anthropologist, what I do here. Now, what is forensic anthropology? Anthropology or forensic anthropology deals with the analysis of recent human remains. Uh, and the main purpose of using a forensic anthropologist together with other forensic scientists is the identification of the deceased. That is the very first step in any criminal or um, unknown person investigation. We try to identify the person to lead the investigation into uh, the right ways. Now, contrary to some uh, things that you might see on TV or read in books about forensic anthropology, we don't only deal with dry bones. Yeah? Um, let's see, here's a typical example there of a, of a scene of found bones, and as you can see, uh, we don't have usually a nice skeleton that is laid out in anatomical position. It's all scattered about, you know, we have to try and identify first what bones we are dealing with. But uh, we also deal with burnt remains, 
mutilated remains, mummified and uh, badly decomposed remains, any remains that are problematic to the identification process of, for the uh, forensic pathologists to do their general work, which is the post-mortem examination followed by identification and the manner and cause of death. Um, we are also not only dealing with the actual remains, but sometimes, or well, more often nowadays, we are dealing with digital representations such as digital x-rays or, more commonly now, post-mortem computer tomography. So we analyze the remains using post-mortem computer tomography, but using anthropological methods. Now, the first question in any case that we deal with is, is it human or not? Yeah, that, that, you know, it, it's the most important question that the police can ask you. And uh, uh, depending on the answer, either the investigation uh, is immediately shut down or it leads on to further um, investigations. So here, just to give you an idea of some of the difficulties that can be experienced at the scene, up here, that looks quite, uh, quite identify that uh, as uh, maybe uh, looking a bit like a human hand. Here are single bones. This here is actually not a human hand. It is something very common around the coastal areas of Ireland. It is a seal flipper. Okay. <laughs> so the anatomy of each of these small bones here will give the forensic anthropologist an idea of if you're dealing with a human or non-human. Yeah. So it's the morphology. These collections here of bones, these are human bones, hand bones. Yeah? Just to give you an idea of the differences. And also something that is uh, very important in our investigation, but that um, proves very difficult for, let's say, a general practitioner who might come out to the scene as police surgeon or other people who might be asked first instead of forensic anthropologists, and unfortunately we have that. We have other people coming out to a scene rather than a forensic anthropologist. And you might come across something like this. Now the size of these bones down here is maybe about this. Two inches maybe. Now, on the right, that's your chicken dinner, <laughs> right? That's, your, that's, what's, that's chicken bones. Adult chicken bones, I can see that because the uh, bone ends here are fused, it's all, they're all complete. But on the left, I have a neonate chin bone, human neonate chin bone. So it's not only, um, not only do we need to know the adult skeleton, what the adult skeleton and the vari variation in the adult skeleton looks like, but we need to know the development from fetal development all the way up to adult skeleton of the skeletal system. We need to know, if we want to identify someone, we need to know the progression in the development of the skeleton up to adulthood. Yeah. So after we've answered the question if it's human or non-human, uh, the next question is, let's say, we say it's human, so that's the coroner's act then kicking in. Um, the coroner will then direct the investigation and say, look, uh, I need to know, is it forensic or historical? So we might have something like this. And this from the context and from the surrounding evidence that you can't see here, this is an archaeological, these are archaeological remains. Whereas this here is a case of forensic interest. We have burn marks, we have much pressure appearance of the bones, we have some uh, fatty contents left inside the bone, there's a, quite a different aspect to the remains here. So in a forensic case, the coroner will investigate further, state pathologists get involved and so on, and we do a full forensic investigation. In a historical case, the coroner says, I'm not interested anymore, yeah, uh, it's not a forensic case, and I'm closing my investigation. So immediately after, here in Ireland, the coroner's act ceases and the National Monument Act kicks in. So the remains now have to be reported to the National Museum in Ireland, who are the uh, legal repository uh, for human remains, uh, for ancient human remains throughout Ireland. Right? So it, only because something is not of forensic interest doesn't mean that the law stops. Right? Okay, so we have decided they are of uh, forensic interest. Then we, um, we are looking at how many people are we actually dealing with here. Right? 
Uh, are we dealing with one individual, two, more? Uh, like in this situation here, where we have a human rights violation situation with mass graves. In that case, we have to separate and try separate each individual in the laboratory uh, to provide the best possible avenue for identification. Or in this case here, it's a case I had from County Kildare, which turned out to be historical in the end. Um, but you see, these were the remnants here, the remains found, and I pieced it together to see if I'm dealing with one or two individuals or more. Yeah? By counting the bones, by putting them together, and say, these represent only one individual. At the same time, I also have to examine each of the fracture margins to see if any of these might point to um, suspicious fractures. Or are these fractures that were caused by taking the remains out of the ground, you know, by digging and so on. So that's very important, but can be very difficult to identify. So after that, we establish a biological profile. The biological profile will uh, be used to help the investigating officers in identifying the person. And for us, the ancestry or ethnicity of the person is very important. Yeah. Age, age at death, and the biological sex of the person, the stature, if we have the bones available to uh, you know, estimate the stature, and any pathology or trauma. Uh, so um, mostly for um, the ancestry um, determination, uh, like a geographic background, what we need is a skull. Yeah? And I'm basing all this, the biologic profile, all of this is based on non-destructive methodology. These are methods that we can use by observing, by taking measurements, by scanning, anything bar taking a section or a bone sample out of it. Now that is the first step, because we have to be conscious of um, the fact that the remains, after we are finished, as a forensic anthropologist is finished analyzing the remains, they will go to other forensic specialists. So anything you do to the remains has to be recorded. And if you can avoid destructive analysis, you do so because you are creating another artifact in the remains. Yeah. So we use craniometric analysis um, statistical analysis for ancestry determination. There are certain programs that we can use and also the morphology of the facial region gives us an idea, but it gets more and more difficult nowadays. When they, how, how do you mean ancestry? Ancestry in this case means a geographic origin. It doesn't necessarily mean here in the wider sense of ancestry, ancestry uh, a family relationship. In this case it means we are trying to identify where that person most likely originated from geographically uh, or what type of geographic group they might fit in, like you know, um, so it gives the police an idea uh, what the person might have looked like, what they're looking for. And so. um, then the age at death. Um, this is just an example here, cranial suture analysis, but they are not that uh, that great to use. There's other ways here. We can use the dentition if we have the dentition. We can use some uh, of the long bones. The younger the person is that died the easier it is to define an age range for that person. Because, well, you know, the skeleton develops from uh, inside the womb up until about age 30. The skeleton develops at certain stages. When you reach around age 30, that's it. It's going downhill from then on. Uh -huh. Right? So because of that, we only have degenerative uh, traits that we can look at, and they will only allow us to look at a very wide range, uh, overlapping range of ages. So the younger the person, particular infants, uh, adolescents, and so on, we can really be quite specific about an age, uh, because we know when a certain tooth has to develop, what size a bone has to be when they develop, what the facial features has to, when they have to develop. Yeah? Uh, then the biological sex as mentioned um, usually use the pelvis and the skull and uh, if you have a full skeleton or part skeleton that allows you to use it, always use the pelvis for sex estimation before the skull. The skull can be ambiguous, the pelvis you can also be ambiguous but usually gives you a better clue. Why? Because the pelvis is designed by nature to be different between men and women. Uh, whereas the skull is only reacting to muscle mass and some genetics, some morphology, but muscle mass mostly. Um, 
the, the, the pelvis is designed for parturition uh, in females, so uh, it gives us a much better idea. And stature, if you have the long bones, in particular the lower limb bones of the remains, then we can attempt stature estimation. Now this is an estimation and it's always given in ranges. When I see something on TV and they say, oh, he was six foot one or he was one meter 85 or something like that, I always cringe because I say, well, what's the standard deviation? Where, are, I mean, what's the range? You're talking about the average for that person. That person is not necessarily six foot one. Is it better to give the police maybe the average, let's say six foot one, and the standard deviation that you have come up with through the formula taken from the, um, from the bone measurements and say, look, you're looking at someone between five foot eight and six foot two, right? Something like that. So you don't lose someone from a missing person list that you want them to look at. And then we're looking at pathologies. For example, here we have a very nice healed but angular fracture of the forearm. Yeah. So that has healed quite a long time before death, maybe a few years, yeah, but it has healed at an angle so it wasn't rightly set, so we can see that. Or here, like this, uh, uh, quite a, a recent case. Um, in red, I've marked the fracture line here. This is an autopsy cut, and this was a section taken out by the pathologist during autopsy, but when we got the remains, I cleaned the whole uh, area. There was still soft tissue in some places attached. And then I examined, and we had this very fine fracture line running all the way into the orbit, and that was what we call a perimortem fracture, a fracture that occurred around the time of death. So that was suspicious. Moving on to the belly bone. So now you know broadly what a forensic anthropologist does in a normal forensic case, what they follow through, you know, and uh, the biological profile is one of the most important um, uh, reports that we have to write for the police. Now, in the Barrymore case, when I was approached by Jim and uh, Roger Dewberry, um, I first thought, geez, how, how, I have no idea. I've never done it before. I have, I have no idea how to, how to help them. Uh, but what I have done before and what I have gone through before is the licensing uh, issues and I'm aware of the different laws and regulations that apply to human remains in Ireland. So when I was approached about uh, how do we go about uh, taking samples and test human remains that are located in a mausoleum somewhere in County Cork, as I said, oh, well, you know, there are different steps that you have to go through. You cannot just go in and take the samples. And the, the, the other question for me was, uh, what, there has to be a good reason behind testing human remains. Uh, only because we can access and test remains doesn't mean we, ha we should. You know, there are ethical implications here. And um, I think when... Um, Roger and Jim explained to me what they were looking for, and I saw the historical uh, uh, questions coming out of the, the family questions, yes, of course, but particular uh, historical Irish history. Uh, there's a, here's a family, uh, Irish historical family, um, that's quite important, and it um, provides us with a opportunity to actually look into uh, what the dead can tell us and what the living can tell us because we had the DNA from the uh, buried descendants as well and uh, for me quite selfishly I, uh, the interest was how would that be possible to use in a forensic application yeah? how would I be able to use results from here how could I incorporate that in a forensic investigation so it was something that I wanted to learn about as well and um, uh, so after after talking at length and talking about the uh, issues involved, uh, I decided yes, I would be happy to help. And um, so the first uh, step was to find out if there were any uh, direct surviving um, relatives of uh, the Barrymore family, because if there were, this is the first port of call for any permission to touch or examine the remains. No question about it. But they were, the direct line uh, stopped as far as I was concerned. It stopped, I think, um, 
uh, the Earls of Bevo with, with Richard Berry, but I, ca I cannot be absolutely sure. I think Jim knows more about that. Anyway, we did not have di a direct surviving line there. Uh, so who do you ask for permission? Uh, if you don't have to frame, who do you ask for permission to access and uh, test the remains? Now, in this case, coroner. Well, the coroner is not interested in historical case, but anyway, we asked the coroner just to make sure, you know, got their opinion on it because they'd like to be asked. <laughs> so we, we did that and said, no, that's fine, nothing to do with us. Church authorities, because that mausoleum is on church ground, yeah, and it belongs to, to, to the church. But there's a unique, there's a very unique situation here where the mausoleum is on church ground, but it falls outside the church authority. And it also falls outside the county council authority, so they were not responsible for it either. Nobody was responsible for it. It was looked after, the, the mausoleum is looked after by the local caretaker, John Sisk, and he does a fantastic job without any extra help, any financial help, or anything like that, and, and uh, just, just because he feels he, that's something that he needs to do. And um, he's a lovely man. I met him there. Very helpful. So none of them now, uh, you know, no coroner's act here. Do they then fall under the National Monuments Act because they're ancient? And they do. Yeah, they're old, they're ancient remains, they fall under the National Monuments Act. Um, even if you go up to 19, if you go up to 1916, um, these remains fall under the National Monuments Act if there's no relatives surviving. Yeah. So. Just to cut that a bit shorter, we went, uh, I went, and I um, applied for a license. It's a license to alter an archaeological object. This is what the remains are under the legislation. And we got the license, uh, 5756, uh, <coughs> to take samples from the remains in the buried more crypt. Now, if they hadn't been buried or hadn't been deposited in the buried more crypt, if they had been below ground, if they had been buried in the soil, we would have also have to uh, apply for a license to excavate. Uh, and that is a completely different order. It's the same institution that you have to apply to, but... And then we have to, because we sent samples over to the US and to the UK, I don't think we sent it to the UK, just to the US, but if we were going to send something also for radiocarbon dating, in, in the future, it's going to Belfast, we also have to have a license to export an archaeological object. You know? So I was able to help uh, uh, Jim and Roger with all this, got through the licensing system, we got the license in place, and I visited the mausoleum in Castle Island, yeah, lovely, lovely spot, and you see there's the side entrance, this is the main part, but the main part doesn't lead to the crypt, it's the side entrance here. It's a very fascinating place, Castle Lines, and if you ever want to have a look at that cemetery, it's, 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 it has so much history, uh, so much family history as well. We had a, actually, when we were walking down there, my colleague Dr. Mario Novak and I, we had a bus stopping there, and I think there were uh, some American tourists who came out to look up their families <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the graveyard. And if you're, and usually, because the Castle Lines, it's Fermoy, you would want to stay, you know, the larger thing. And I tell you one thing, the best pint I ever had was in Fermoy. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, Fermoy, the Forge Bar and Grill. <laughs> Sorry, had to, but it was, I just my job. So, this is how we prepared. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Mario Novak, uh, archaeologist, and myself. And um, everything that you see here, all the instrumentation that we have here, everything. Um, the lighting system, everything is powered by batteries because there's no, uh, no access to electricity. And what's most important, it was all crowdfunded because we had absolutely no funding for that project. Yeah? There was no university funding, and no research grant for that, uh, which had been crowdfunding did, did the job. And it's, it's actually a very good way of getting these projects funded. Um, so we set all this up down in the crypt, and then we access the coffin, coffin one and two. That's coffin uh, one when you come in. Uh, it's also called in the other talk by Jim, uh, Barrymore one, and that's coffin two, Barrymore two. This is the skull found in coffin one. 
I'm just flying through it now because I'm aware of the time. Uh, and we had a problematic fit with the mandible lower jaw um, uh, that was found in coffin one. It didn't anatomically fit that skull. Uh, so again, here comes the part where you start, because we know that these coffins have been opened many times over uh, the last century. Um, there has been vandalism down there in that crypt, and we don't, when we approach this, we don't know who is in these coffins. There were no coffin plates. We, we saw where the coffin plates used to be on the lid, but they weren't there. Yeah? So we don't know who we were dealing with. So we are just saying, okay, we open mind. We are trying to just, uh, uh, you know, give a biological profile to each of these individuals and see who they might fit. So that was the first thing that we saw that something had been misplaced because then we saw that that oh sorry, that that mandible fitted the skull in the other coffin. Okay, and then uh, the other coffin here we, we see there's a lot of dried skin still left on that skull. There's a lot of mummification still in the lower limbs as well. Um, we found some interesting pathologies, and we found evidence of interference. First of all, here there's a uh, there's an upper arm bone in coffin two that actually belonged to the individual in coffin uh, one. So again, something has been mixed up. Uh, then in coffin one, we found this newspaper. There were lots of shredded newspaper remnants here. You see the date, 1894. That coffin was supposed to be buried in 1753. So it had been opened at, at the very least at that date. At that date. And Unfortunately, for coffin two, particularly very more true, uh, fire has been set inside the coffin as well in the uh, in the area or around the pelvis and the lower legs, and uh, has also destroyed it. So we found matchboxes in there as evidence as well, and then we also found evidence of uh, Charlotte uh, Smithbury uh, of uh, there was supposed to be an urn down there in that crypt, uh, placed in 1933, and uh, this is, I found this wedged between two uh, cobblestones in the crypt. It is evidence that the urn was there at some stage, but it had been destroyed. So then we found these pathologies, the Eagle syndrome here is just an elongated cellular process here. Not necessarily anything bad, it's just you know, nice to notice. A lot of back problems yeah, here, particularly in uh, individual two, but also in individual one. Uh, arthritis of the jaw, uh, the fractures here, they're clearly all um, post-mortem, you know, either due to vandalism or when they were taken out, I'm not sure exactly when, but it wasn't anything perimortem. And here, severe arthritis of the lumbar vertebrae in your lower region of the spine here. So something very interesting. And then the DNA sampling, see our setup inside the crypt, and we took samples from the thigh bones here in coffin two, this from coffin one, and you can see how short but very thick these bones are. The bones are very thick. <coughs> and um, that is something interesting because we know look, these people, it, the, the berry moth, or if they're part of the berry moth, they were all horse riding. Most of the time they spent their time on horses. And you have a very thick cortical bone here in both cases. and uh, that could be an indication of the activity, of some uh, physical activity that they actually carried out on a daily basis. We thought we got some good material here because it, when you cut the bone with a saw like that, it gives you an idea of the collagen content by the smell. So when you smell it, you know, okay, I should have very good collagen content here. Okay, so then the profile forensic, um, we had an European Caucasian ancestry in both cases from the skull. In individual one, the sex was clearly male, uh, we estimate or determined it to be male. In two, it was to, the skull and the pelvis was very gracile and very ambiguous. We later heard from DNA that it was a male, but the morphological analysis was very, very ambiguous. And uh, so we couldn't determine it morphologically. Also, this part of the um, pelvis that was of uh, importance uh, for sex determination was destroyed through the fire. 
Uh, then the older adult here, um, we could only say that it was above 50 years at the age of death, maybe up to 70, but we didn't want to, um, um, we didn't want to uh, give too short a, a, an age determination range because we hadn't been able to examine the whole of the remains because some of them were still covered in soft tissue, mummified soft tissue. And then the other one in uh, Coffin 2, middle adult, 35 to 65, it's a very broad range, but again, we only had certain parts of that uh, skeleton available to, to look at. So at the next step, we want to go down and have a look again. And then the stature, this is quite interesting. The coffin inside length of Coffin 1 measured 188.5 centimeters. Using different formula for stature estimation, the person in there was somewhere 163, 165 centimeters, so quite small. Right? So you have this quite large coffin and a very small person in there. I wonder if that's something to do with uh, how they wanted to appear in death, like, <laughs> you know. Uh, and the stature, uh, actually, for the other one, unfortunately, the femoral uh, parts were just for the full measurements were destroyed in the fire and in some cases covered still by soft tissue. We didn't want to take the soft tissue off, so we only measured the length, the inside length of that coffin. That's actually 170, much smaller. So, then something to look at just um, that we saw. We can't be sure, of course, who these people are yet. But when we look at portraits, and unfortunately they are quite fuzzy because of they were pulled from the internet. <laughs> uh, but their portraits exist, and if you need to access them, then uh, I think the next step would be to do some photo superimposition with the skulls and the portraits and the bust. Uh, photo superimposition, uh, so I have to go back and I have to laser scan the skulls in the crypt so that I have a 3D representation of that. And uh, because the nasal traits of the berry, uh, here, th this is the first, uh, uh, fourth era uh, of berry are quite distinctive, and in both cases of the skull, we see quite uh, strong nasal representation there. So we want to have a look at that. And you can see here is actually a contemporary uh, caricature, 1791, of um, Richard Berry, the seventh Earl of Berry, and his brothers. So they came after, but you can still see, even in the caricature, and particularly in the caricature, the nasal part. Yeah. So this is quite important. This is something to follow up. So possibilities for further analysis, uh, non-destructive, where we do a full craniometric examination um, uh, of the two skulls again, and do a 3D scanning. Uh, you know, usually I prefer CT, but because we can't take the remains out, I'll, I'll bring a laser scanner or a light scanner down there and take, uh, take a scan of these and compare these to the portraits and busts. Uh, there's also the possibility of then printing, 3D printing, uh, the skulls from the scan and sent them for facial uh, reconstruction to our colleagues in Dundee in Scotland. So we can have a look at, you know, if, if the facial reconstruction represents the portraits. And then destructive analysis, we can retake some samples because, uh, for DNA analysis and this time we're not going for the femur, we are going to try the middle and inner ear part of the temporal bone and also send samples for Barrymore 1 to radiocarbon dating to make sure that uh, if that is the fourth Earl, if, uh, his, um, if the radiocarbon dates fall within his time of death. Thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask me, send me an email, or check out the website. And uh, uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present here today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, We're now going to switch over to uh, Jim's slides, and I'm just going to get them up here. And there are Jim's slides. We're not doing too badly for time. Uh, we have about 25 minutes left, Jim. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the microphone beside you, and I think you'd probably be preferred to have to be seeing the slides rather than the audience. So. Do you have a preference? That's just fine. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to position this here. I think the now. Can you can you speak a little, Jim, and we'll see if yeah, you can I hear them at the back? Okay. Try speaking. Hello. Can oh, you hear that? Word. 
Yeah, okay, we are, we are receiving you loud and clear. I'm going to leave that <coughs> down there. Um, Jim, uh, where are you speaking from? Can you tell us? I'm speaking from my home in Reston, Virginia, not far from Washington, D.C. Can you all hear that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, then I think we're ready to go. Um, let me change this over here. And uh, these are the... Oh, let me get rid of that and then do that. Fine. Okay, Jim, take it away. Okay, thank you, Morris, and thank you very much for today. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our colleague <coughs> Roger, who couldn't be here today. He is really the um, person who conceived this project. Also, as Renee mentioned, uh, all of our uh, work here has been privately funded, so I would uh, like to express my uh, appreciation to our generous contributors, as well as to the members of the Barry Project who provided DNA results for comparison, and uh, our several laboratory partners. Next slide, please. One of the things that is uh, important about this kind of work is that you have to start with a goal. Uh, simply digging up remains in order to test them uh, is not very productive unless you know what you're looking for, which of course is common to all DNA research. And in our case, we wanted to attempt to identify Barrymore 1 and Barrymore 2. We knew that the crypt had been constructed for James Barry, the fourth girl of Barrymore, but we also knew that it had been vandalized and that over time other remains had been placed in the crypt and later removed. So we wanted to determine, if possible, who the individuals remaining in the crypt were. We wanted to find out whether or not any living men with the Barry surname might be related to these individuals, and therefore find some important, useful historical information about the origins and evolution of the family. Uh, we were aware that this initial testing was unlikely to be conclusive, so we wanted to use the initial results to establish research priorities, and also more generally, we wanted to determine whether this kind of work actually is useful for uh, genealogical and historical research. Uh, on the next slide, you see that we began with DNA testing and, and extraction. Rene and his colleague, Mario Novak, took three samples. Um, they took uh, three from the femur of Barrymore 1 and two from the femur of Barrymore 2. We decided at the outset that although it would have been useful to try to attempt next generation uh, sequencing, that the samples were likely to be of such poor quality that we probably wouldn't have been successful. That sort of testing requires very large and robust samples. So what we decided to do was to test a small number of short tandem repeat STR markers and then see what conclusions we could draw. We were very fortunate that one of the technicians at Family Tree DNA, gene by gene, the parent company of Family Tree DNA, got interested in this and was willing to work with us, although it is not uh, a common product line of the commercial laboratories. So what she did is did a basic extraction, a PCR extraction, uh, isolation and amplification, and then using uh, primers that had been developed by uh, government laboratories or in-house at Gene by Gene, she then proceeded on to do STR testing, which is shown in the next slide. Um, so basically she did PCR amplification and fragment isolation and then used uh, an Applied Biosystems 3730 uh, frequency analyzer. And she actually had to sequence each STR individually. And she had to go back and do multiple sequencing for DYS19. So this was all very detailed, very complex, hands-on work that uh, required a great deal of effort. Uh, also, we were careful to be concerned about uh, contamination so Renee and Mario did Y-DNA testing, and we're happy to report that they did not contaminate the remains during their examination. Um, on the next slide, you'll see our initial um, STR results from Barrymore 1. Um, Barrymore 1's results were uh, quite limited, but we did manage to get 14 markers, which were adequate for some preliminary analysis. From Barrymore 2, we were disappointed to only have been able to get eight markers. Um, but we were uh, able to uh, 
conclude that the two individuals were probably not related. Uh, Barrymore 2 sample may have been contaminated or there may have been a testing area, but it's pretty clear that these individuals were not related to one another. Uh, the next slide shows the 14 results that we got from Barrymore 1. If you've been in genetic genealogy, Y-DNA testing for some time, some of those patterns may look familiar to you. We took the first 12 markers and used them to try to predict a haplogroup for Barrymore 1. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see the results of one of the uh, haplogroup predictors. This is with Anthony's predictor. And you can see that it returns a 99% probability of R1B. Um, for those of you who are into Y-DNA testing, this is not a big surprise for an Irish male. Uh, but we did want to double check it, so we went to one of the newer predictors, which is on the next slide. Uh, this is the NevGen predictor. And it re, uh, returned a uh, almost identical result, 98.7% uh, probability of R1B. So we are quite confident that Barrymore 1, whoever he was, was in haplogroup R1B. Uh, on the next slide, uh, this uh, shows our attempt at doing STR matching. Um, this was initially um, a challenge for us because there were no STR matches in the Family Tree DNA database, uh, which uses a genetic distance, that is a number of mismatch markers, of one as its default. So nobody in their database of thousands of people matched Barrymore 1 at a genetic distance of one. This was due to the fact that uh, in the results for Barrymore 1, there are three very unusual off-modal markers. Uh, we think that these may have been unique to his line, or uh, there may have been subsequent mutations so that those marker values are no longer present in descendants of the Barry family. We did find a number of matches in the various haplogroup projects, and these were concentrated in three particular subclades, which will be familiar to you if you've done research in Irish families, L21, uh, U152, and DF27. The next step then, was to compare what we got with results from the Barry DNA project. Uh, we established this several years ago to investigate the Barry family that came to Ireland in the uh, Cambro-Norman invasion of the 12th century. We actually think that rather than Norman, the family is of Flemish origin, which becomes important for some of our later analysis. Uh, but there are at least six different surname origins for the Barry family. In addition to the Anglo-Norman or Flemish, there are three Irish clans, uh, a Scottish Barry, and English or uh, French Barrys, who often anglicized their names or converted their names to Barry. So this is quite challenging to sort out. We do, however, have about 125 test results available from either Family Tree DNA or other companies where we're able to access the results online. Uh, what we discovered is that there are, in this project, at least 30 distinct unrelated paternal lineages. Unlike Barrymore 1, the great majority of the participants in the Barry project are in R1B. And it's not surprising that because most of them trace their ancestry to Ireland, almost half of them are in haplogroup L21. But when we look more deeply in L21, we find that there are at least 20 unrelated subclades, so the, the uh, clusters here are quite small. The largest cluster in the project is in um, Z49, uh, a subclade of uh, U152, with about a quarter of the participants falling into that group. So our next step then was to take a look at um, the family histories and see which ones of these groups are the best candidates to be related to Barrymore 1. And so we look for those on the next slide. Uh, if you're aware, because of the paucity of uh, Irish records prior to the 18th century, very few families can document their relationship to uh, earlier individuals. Um, and in fact, uh, there are very few people in the Barry Project who have pedigrees that go back before that time. But in terms of who might be related to the Earls of Barrymore, certainly the largest group in the project with a common Barry ancestor back in the 12th century is a good candidate. 
The second largest group is in the subclade of uh, L21. Um, these are people whose families came from County Limerick, but our guess is because they're in a uh, haplogroup which is labeled the Irish C haplogroup, that they're more likely to have been descended from an Irish family rather than an Anglo-Norman or Flemish family. We do have 10 men who have paper documentation of a relationship to the Earls of Barrymore through some East Cork and Dublin branches of the family. Um, these are based on privately published family histories, uh, and the primary source for this is a family Bible. However, when we've done testing of these individuals, what we discovered is that they fell into three distinct haplogroups, groups, so they're clearly not related to one another. And when we look more deeply into the documentation, we found that there are gaps and inconsistencies. So there are questions about the legitimacy of those pedigrees, but they are certainly warrant investigation. On the next uh, slide, you'll see what happens when we went into the family tree DNA matching algorithms and tried to see what happened when we compared Barry Moore 1 to the um, members of the Barry Project. Um, this is a tool that's available to uh, project administrators, and you can see that we uh, can measure uh, up to a genetic distance of three, and it goes back 24 generations. We have a small but plausible probability that Barry Moore 1 was a match to the Z49 group, that is the largest group in the project, and also to the L159.2 group because they have identical 12 marker haplotypes. They do differ at 25 markers and beyond. Now, importantly, Z49 is found in significant numbers in both Normandy and Flanders, while L159.2 is entirely absent in the results from, with ancestry from those regions. Uh, we do have one other man whose um, results matched. Um, he's a South African, and it's probably just coincidental. But importantly, what we conclude is all of the other groups in the Barry Project are unrelated to Barry Moore 1. And this includes the men whose paper pedigrees indicate that they might have been related. Um, now, the, on the next slide, you can see what happens if we go beyond the 24 generations that uh, Family Tree DNA gives us in this calculator. If we extrapolate, we can see that over the past 900 years or so, since the Barry family has been in Ireland, the probability of a common ancestor between the Z49 group and Barry Moore 1 may be greater than 50%. If you go to the next slide, um, we have done a detailed comparison, not only with the individual results and the modal results, but we also took a look at the range, the high and low, the maximum and minimum, ranges within each project. Let me uh, take a look, for example, at uh, DYS392, uh, the third line from the bottom. You can see that Barrymore 1 had a value of 12. The modal for Z49 is a 13, so that's a mismatch. But the range within the project is 12 to 13, so it does fall within the range. If we look at the ranges rather than the modal, we can find that the, G, uh, the genetic distance between the Z49 group and Barrymore 1 could be as low as 1, which is quite plausible for the difference in time. Uh, that's displayed graphically on the next chart, which shows uh, three lines representing uh, genetic distances of 5 at the bottom in purple, 3 in the middle in, I guess that's teal, and a 1 at the top. And what you can see is that there is a uh, quite a significant probability, maybe somewhere between 40 and 80 percent, that Barry Moore 1 is a match to the Z49 group with a common ancestor sometime shortly after the Campbell Norman invasion of Ireland. Now, turning to Barry Moore 2, as you can see, there are so many mismatches in Barry Moore 1 or two, then clearly unrelated. Uh, our guess is that Barry Moore II may have been a, a nephew through a maternal line, or possibly the husband of one of the female members of the Barry family. 
but we need further research to determine whether that's the case. Um, so if we turn now to our conclusions, this is what we can tentatively uh, determine, I believe. It is possible that Barry Moore won. He was James Barry, the fourth Earl of Barry Moore. He's the individual for, it, for whom the uh, crypt was constructed. Uh, Renee's analysis is consistent with that conclusion, though not conclusive. And they, he does have a potential match to the largest group of men in the Barry project. Unfortunately, we were unable to confirm that because SNP testing in U152 and Z49 at Family Tree DNA failed. And the sample that is there is now depleted. Um, also, FUNA has left uh, Family Tree DNA and uh, we no longer have anyone there to do the testing. So our most critical task is to confirm his identity, his haplogroup, and his subclade. Uh, the results for Barry Moore II, unfortunately, were so fragmentary that we are not able to draw any significant conclusions about him, and his sample is also completed. So, one of our goals was to determine a research strategy, and what we are planning to do now is, as Renee indicated, some continuing effort to confirm Barry Moore one's identity through his physical traits using the methodologies that Renee described. Uh, we are also uh, initiating some new DNA tests using existing samples. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to get any of either the commercial or the academic labs to agree to collaborate with us. So at the moment, we are not able to use the most advanced um, next generation sequencing techniques. Uh, but we are currently partnering with two labs in Germany. One's a, one is a forensic lab and the other is a lab that specializes in Y-DNA testing to see if we can draw some further <laughs> conclusions. Well, those tests are now underway, uh, in, uh, just as described in the next slide. Um, unfortunately, the uh, first attempt at extraction by the forensic lab failed, so the second lab is now attempting to uh, do an extraction, see if we can get Sanger sequencing, and we're going to focus on the three major subclades. Uh, and in particular Z49, to see if we can confirm that relationship. Uh, we also may do some additional SNP and STR testing because in that Z49 group, we have eight sets of results from uh, comprehensive big Y testing. So we actually have identified three subclades that are private and exclusive to the Barry families of County Cork. And if we were fortunate enough to get a match between Barry Moore 1 and one of those subclades, then we will have essentially conclusive evidence of the relationship. We're also going to continue working at Barry Moore 2 and keeping our fingers, fingers crossed there. Let me move in the next slide to some general lessons because I know there's a lot of interest in the possibility of doing this with other families. Uh, the first lesson, of course, is that this is hard. There are legal, logistical, financial, and technical challenges that have to be overcome. There are no precedents, and every case is unique. And it's very important that collaboration among forensic anthropologists, historians, and genetic genealogists um, be the watchword in text like this. Also, our experience tells us that the results may be incomplete, they may be frustrating, and you may just have to keep working at it to try to get useful information. Uh, so there are some significant challenges, which are evident from the next slide here. Um, first of all, uh, you need to do thorough background research. Uh, it, this background research needs to include not only historical research, but it needs to include very comprehensive Y-DNA testing. There are legal and ethical uh, considerations that have to be taken into account. Um, there are significant uh, hurdles to surmount, as Renee has indicated, in terms of extraction and exporting samples. And if the remains are um, buried rather than above ground, as Renee indicated, additional permissions are required and cost will then skyrocket. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, special expertise like Renee's is required. Not only genetic genealogy, but forensic anthropology needs to be uh, part of this. As Renee indicated, uh, we had a, uh, a terrible sense of timing. We took samples from the femur because that was the standard at the time. 
Uh, subsequently, uh, academic researchers have discovered that samples taken from the pectus bone are much more reliable, so that's one of the things that we are planning to look at possibly when we get back. Perhaps the most challenging part of the whole was finding laboratories that were willing to do this kind of work. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we discovered is that we had to use multiple laboratories and several rounds of testing. So, um, if we move to the final slide, um, these projects are costly. Um, our project uh, cost in the thousands of dollars or euros. Um, some projects like this may uh, be as much as tens of thousands of euros or dollars. There are no dedicated funding sources. There are no grants for this kind of work. Um, they are not covered by current academic uh, research programs. So ours was entirely funded by private contributions. Um, it appears, at least in the near term, this sort of ancestral DNA testing is probably not a viable product line for the commercial laboratories. <laughs> it requires special expertise, special equipment, and we were very fortunate to find one technician who was willing to work with us, uh, but that technician has left and the company is no longer doing this sort of work. We would prefer to collaborate with the academic laboratories, but I think there's a reality here. This sort of work is generally regarded to fall outside the area of population genetics, which is the field in which uh, the major academic uh, DNA testing labs are working. Um, those tend to deal with prehistory. Anything really after the Bronze Age uh, is not a current focus of research. Uh, also, unless there's something very interesting uh, methodologically or historically about the findings, uh, most of the high quality academic journals are not particularly interested in genetic genealogy publications. So what we need to do is to get support from the genetic genealogy community, try to enlist the assistance of some of the academic labs that have the highest uh, quality equipment and uh, research expertise and see if we can move this along. And our hope is that if we can just continue pressing ahead with this project and get uh, published in a, um, a good quality journal, that that will occur. Um, so on the final slide, uh, we have the website for our project, and this is my direct email, jbarry6899 at me.com. Um, and I see by the clock that I have come in one minute under the hour, <laughs> so I don't know if we have any time for questions or not. But if we do, I would be happy to try to entertain some. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. <laughs> for a few questions, so what I'm going to do is turn you around to face your audience, and um, uh, both Renee and Jim will be uh, available for questions. So uh, congratulations to both of you, first of all, because this is such a fascinating project. It's the first time that we've actually dug up our ancestors and actually tried to uh, link their DNA to the DNA of living uh, descendants today. So uh, a couple of questions for Jim. Jared, and uh, loud voice, because yeah. Jim has got the uh, microphone. Uh, congratulations, this is a, an amazing project and probably, hopefully, the first of many. The breakthrough in Petrus bone testing was done by the Pinhasi lab in UCD. Is there any possibility at all? I, I understand all of the constraints you mentioned about your considered population genetic. Is there any way they could help out? Um, I can answer that uh, because I have, I know Ron, uh, I used to work in UCD. Uh, until quite recently, and uh, no, there is no possibility. <laughs> okay, that's clear. Um, we have a question from John Reed at the back there. Uh, I guess I project. Um, you, you mentioned at the end of your presentation the possibility of um, uh, radiocarbon dating of this, and there are other um, isomers, not isomers. Isotope for Isotopes, that is, yes. That are used in this kind of testing. Uh, is that a, would that be a priority? Um, maybe not necessarily a priority. I think the um, digital or the virtual um, capture of the remains is important, particularly the facial and the uh, red of, uh, rest of the head region would be the priority. Radiocarbon for Barrymore 1, yes, it will give us a further clue 
you know, it would be not another stone in the mosaic. But um, let's say isotope testing, I put that in there if you want a really rounded project. And as Jim said, something that we can publish in uh, a good journal, uh, we need to find something more. And uh, these stable isotopes, for example, would tell us maybe something about that individual, like uh, what the diet was, what the exact geograph, where, where he or she spent their formative years and so on. But um, So it wouldn't be a priority as such, but it would be something that um, uh, I would consider if, there, uh, if we had the financial means to do it, to round off the whole thing and also to suggest it to other researchers you know and other projects that you know when you're looking into family research there's one thing to, to is, is to find out about the DNA and, and how everything is linked but another thing is why you have the ability to do it what about that individual you're actually test that dead person that deceased person we might have some records or something uh, from them um, in writing but it wouldn't it be great to put Put a little bit more flesh onto the bone, so to speak. You know, where we say, like, okay, he or she suffered from these kind of illnesses, and we see in their diary, yes, they had that. You know, or uh, uh, you know, look, their main diet was consistent of marine food or you know terrestrial food, things like that. Just to give a little bit more uh, information to the individual we are actually examining here. But no, uh, the priority would maybe be the radiocarbon dating for very more one, but particularly the um, scanning of the of the of the of the skulls, like yeah. I have just a couple of thoughts. First of all, sure. John, I want to thank you very much for your question and for your assistance a couple of months ago. Um, John, as you probably know, has uh, published a fascinating article uh, on Richard the Third, the tests that were done on Richard the Third, in which he used Bayesian analysis to try to. Uh, uh, determine the probability that those remains were Richard's. Um, he was uh, very kind to comment on a Bayesian analysis that I did, which indicated that there is somewhere between an 80 and a 99% probability that Barrymore I is indeed James Barry, the fourth uh, Earl of Barrymore. Um, as Renee has indicated, radiocarbon dating is something that we may want to do for completeness, but it's my understanding that the standard deviation of a result from 18th century remains maybe as great as 200 years. Yes. So we might be able to determine with confidence that this individual lived sometime, say, between 1700 and 1900. But um, it doesn't in itself necessarily provide unique information. Um, the uh, isotope analysis, of course, is quite expensive. But it could be very interesting because uh, James Barry, the fourth Earl of Barrymore, was a soldier. He was a lieutenant general. And he um, served in the Low Countries and also in Spain. And in fact, he was imprisoned in Spain. So it's conceivable that some traces might be found that could provide additional supporting information that that individual had spent time in those particular regions. In any event, um, I think at the moment our priority is trying to get some additional more comprehensive DNA analysis and this other supporting analysis, while useful, will probably wait until we have those results. Okay, we have one final question from Conor O'Brien. Just a question on how far back we can go. What is the sell by date for taking DNA from, uh, say, going back 900 years? Is it successful, or is there a couple of areas where you can't get anything well, more out of we're going back to 6,000 years, and we'll be hearing about uh, that from Professor Dan Bradley later on this afternoon about 4 o'clock. Um, he's actually sampled Neolithic as well as Bronze Age. Bronze Age about, what, 4,000 years ago? Neolithic about 6,000 years ago? And Neanderthal 40,000 years ago. Neanderthal 40,000 years ago? More than that, is it? Not yeah. Dan Bradley. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> the sell by date is going back all the time. You know, it's better than milk. <laughs> I think it, 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 it also de it depends on, I'm looking for, from a forensic perspective now, and even in recent cases, there are problems extracting viable DNA. And it all depends on um, how the remains were deposited, what the surrounding environment was over the time that they were deposited. You know, uh, has anything happened, like the fire, for example? Fire is, is 
you know, if you have remains in, in a house fire or something like that, it's very bad for DNA. Uh, what kind of water environment they might have been lying in? You know, I mean, there's so many different factors that um, that will determine if we can extract viable uh, DNA that we cannot say for sure at the beginning. But if we know some of the surrounding, what we call taphonomy, um, for these bones, you know, but the conditions that acted upon the remains were, then we could give a good idea of saying, look, you probably won't be able to get good DNA, or yes, you might have a chance. And also, what part of the body is actually available? And in this case, we, actually in very more case, we, uh, when I applied for the testing, I hadn't seen the remains. Uh, so I um, applied for testing uh, sections of the long bone as well as teeth. So, but when I actually came and looked in and you saw the skull, there were no teeth. So we couldn't, we could only go with the, with the femoral sections in the end. So, um, it, yeah, it depends on what's there, but it is, it can be very much a hit and miss. And that, that but that's not, uh, not necessarily depending on the age of the women. It's, it's even in recent cases when we work with DNA. You know, TV shows might show, great, DNA is the be on and end all of forensic science. It is not. And there we have to leave it, unfortunately, um, because we're biting into Dennis Wright's time. He'll be talking to us about the DNA of the Dalcassians um, uh, in about two minutes' time. But uh, can I ask you all to put your hands together and give a big thank you to Tim. Thank you. 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 Yeah, which is a pity. I'd love to talk to the people that can uh, have a yeah, chat with you more. Like, you know, I'm glad to hear you.